Okay. Uh, Tom, before I get going, I'm going to try to leave my uh, video on. If by chance anything gets uh, sketchy with my audio or my slides don't advance, please let me know and I'll, I'll turn the video off. Okay. And we can jump in and turn it off. So if Jason sees it's too choppy, he'll just shut you off your video. So the slides will go ahead. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, I appreciate the introduction. And uh, like Tom said, I'm here to talk about invasive carp in the Amoquan Preserve. And uh, I'm gonna bring you today a story uh, or a summary of the story so far. Uh, like you said, my name is Levi Solomon. I work for the Illinois River Biological Station in the Illinois uh, Natural History Survey. I have a few co-authors here and I'd like to lead with acknowledgements. Uh, I did very little uh, of this actual work, uh, if any at all. Uh, so I want to acknowledge Amber Blackert. She is on the left. She is our current Emiquan project coordinator at the field station. And Ali Mendenhall on the right is our previous Emiquan project coordinator uh, at the field station. Uh, everything you're about to see here started under Ali. Uh, when she moved on to DNR, Amber has continued it. So if you like what you see here, uh, hats off to those two. Uh, if you find fault with what you see here, uh, you can direct complaints to me uh, as the messenger. So. Uh, an outline, uh, we're going to focus on silver carp for uh, the summary. We're going to talk a little bit about big head and grass carp. Uh, we're not going to cover common carp very much. Uh, we're all aware they're in there, but I'm for the most part going to ignore common carp in this talk. Uh, I'm going to lead with a background and a timeline. We're going to talk about the monitoring data that IRBS collects on an annual basis, uh, some targeted carp research we picked up, uh, some active removals, a market capture study we have ongoing. Uh, I'm going to close with some agent growth data we've collected over the past few years and some conclusions. Uh, parts of this I'm also going to hit quickly uh, for two reasons. One, I'm going to be up against it on time. And two, because Doug and Jim and uh, Kara have all introduced part of what I'm already going to say. So I'm going to try not to uh, beat certain points to death if they've already hit a couple of So timeline, starting at the left, we have 2007 when the restoration began. How many carp are present? They've been present throughout, they're gonna be present forever. Uh, so I'm pretty much gonna ignore them for the talk like this. Uh, Doug already covered the levees overtopping in 2013, 2015, and 2016. Uh, I'm also gonna mention a few boils were going through the levee, boils of water. Uh, we're going through the levee, uh, letting river water in around the construction of the water control structure. That was in 2015. Uh, so those four potential connections come into play later. Uh, but after those levee overtopping events, uh, in 2016, IRBS staff during our monitoring began to notice small silver carp jumping. Uh, this kind of culminated, culminated in uh, October when Illinois DNR collected the first uh, silver carp from the Emiquan Preserve in belt uh, 512 millimeters. Uh, fast forward to 2017, IRBS collected our first silver carp in our annual monitoring data. Again, an adult, 402 millimeters long. Uh, our staff also observed larger fish jumping during 2017 and into 2018. So come fall of 2018, we start openly wondering how abundant are jumping silver carp in the Emiquan Preserve? Uh, we talked with TNC staff about some of their observations and uh, we decided to implement some preliminary trammel netting for some active removals of silver carp and to collect some specimens for additional study. Uh, the results, were more than a little bit frightening. Uh, several of us on the boat that saw the results kind of reflect uh, margin homer here. Uh, we'll talk about some more of that later, but I will mention here the first big head and grass carps were collected in that token uh, trammel netting in 2018. Uh, a year later, uh, we began a mark recapture study uh, where we marked fish and rely on commercial fishing efforts to recapture, and those commercial fishing efforts continue through this week, potentially. So it is ongoing. Uh, first, I want to cover the monitoring data. Go through this fairly quickly. Uh, but IRBS does routine monitoring every year from 07 to the present. We do day electrofishing, fike netting, mini fike netting. We run 28 sites per year of each gear every year since 2007. So a pretty good effort is going into the Amaquan Preserve. Uh, speaking of carp, day electrofishing should be effective at catching young of year, juveniles, and adults. Uh, fike netting, while a tremendous gear for lots of species, is not worth very much when it comes to uh, detecting any carp species. Uh, mini fike netting should catch any young of your carp species pretty well. Uh, through all of that effort, through all of those years, our routine monitoring data has caught 12 silver carp to date. Uh, zero big head and grass carp. Uh, you remember the grass carp from the previous slide was the camel netting we picked up in 2018. 
breaking that down a little bit, uh, we've caught two silvers in 2017 and 2018, seven in 2019, one in 2020. All of these silver carp came from the pump house ditch. They're all adults, they're mostly all very large. They average 751 millimeters and 5,500 grams, or 30 inches and I think 12 pounds. Uh, we have one uh, that's less than 26 inches on the smaller side while still an adult. That was the first one that we collected that I mentioned. Uh, sizes. So both of these graphs have data from Lagrange Reach in green uh, and data from Emiquan in the orange. Uh, the Lagrange data comes from our, our LTRM monitoring data. I won't go into details there. Again, I'm up against it on time. But we do a lot of work and we collect a lot of data on silver carp from Lagrange. So the graph on the left has the range silver carp from day electro fishing in backwaters. The length on the X, the number of carp on the Y. So if you look at our Lagrange data, most of our silvers are in that peak between say 520 millimeters to about 640. Uh, you can see our smallest Emiquan carp are about 650 millimeters. All the other Emiquan carp are up in the seven, eight, nine hundreds, substantially bigger. Uh, the graph on the right. Uh, again, has Lagrange data in green, Emiquan data in orange. Uh, we still have the length on the X. Now we have the weight of the fish on the Y. Uh, you can see uh, the Emiquan fish are again, substantially longer, substantially heavier. Uh, and, and before I go to the next slide, graphs are a great way to present scientific data. It's a great way to summarize raw data. Uh, you know, it's our, our currency for, for presenting to stakeholders, you know, the public, sponsors, but I'm going to take a page out of the Jason DeBoer playbook, and I'm going to say the eye test is equally as good to present scientific data. I'm going to present two pictures. I'm obviously poking a little fun at Jason. I owe him, I owe him from a few weeks ago, but back on a serious note, uh, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, the picture on the left, we have Spencer Phillips holding an Emiquan silver carp. On the right, we have Maria Brower holding a Lagrange silver carp. Now, the pictures aren't an entirely fair representation based on the way people are holding the fish, not the fish the camera. And Maria's fish is just a little on the small side of the average Lagrange fish, but it's not an unfair comparison either. So Emiquan fish are substantially bigger than our, our average size Lagrange fish. Uh, we can look at this a little more scientifically. We have a metric called relative weight. Uh, it's basically a metric on what a fish should weigh at a given length. The average sized fish, you know, what it weighs at a given length. Uh, we score relative weights on a scale where your average relative weight is a score of 100. If something scores over 100, it's a little on the heavier side, you know, which could mean it's in, it's in better health, it's doing better. If it scores under 100, you know, it's a little light for uh, its length, but that doesn't necessarily mean unhealthy. It just means it looks a little lighter than average. I hope I explained that well enough. Uh, and our Emiquan average relative weight, or WR, is 117 in our monitoring data. For reference, our average silver carp has an average WR on Lagrange of 95. Uh, if anyone's curious, that is a significant difference. Emiquan fish is significantly higher in WR than Lagrange fish. Those are our monitoring data, fish, uh, but silver carp from our removal efforts, where we have more individuals, relative weight is 121.5. So, Silver carp, it's safe to say, are, are fat and happy on the Emiquan Preserve, which is kind of sad. I'm going to switch gears. Remember the timeline? Uh, we talked about after the overtoppings, we started seeing more carp. So prior to 2016, we saw very few. 2016, 2018, we started seeing a lot more. 2018, PNC and IRBS start to question the abundance of silvers in Emiquan. Uh, to get at this a little bit better, we did a targeted effort for silver carp removal and additional research. Uh, for this, we use trammel nets and gill nets. Uh, for context, trammel nets are probably the most effective uh, fisheries gear we have to catch carp species, specifically silvers and big heads. So we did six netting events in late 2018 uh, and the spring of 2019. One of these was a collaboration with uh, Western Illinois. Uh, combined over those six netting events, we removed 60 silvers, four big heads, 121 commons, and 56 grass carp. So again, those results were very frightening to me personally. I never would have dreamed with the token effort we put in, we'd pull that many carp out of Emiquan. Uh, 
this goddess wandering, you know, Inamaquan. Now, starting to question all four species of bunnies. The new common carp or bunnet, we didn't expect that kind of number of silver big head or grass carp. So, what did we do? We, we implemented a mark recapture system. Uh, the math behind this gets kind of complex, but the premise is fairly simple. Basically, if you release uh, a known number of fish into a population uh, that are tagged, go out and try to recapture those fish. Uh, during your recapture efforts, you keep track of how many fish that you catch are untagged versus how many are tagged. Uh, using all that data, you can make a population estimate for the species. So to do this, we did more trammel netting. Uh, we emptied the field station for a two-day tagging event. I think we had six boats going. And we jaw tagged 89 silver carp, 19 big head carp. Uh, we fin clipped 187 common carp and 20 grass carp. Like I said earlier, we're relying on commercial fishermen efforts for the recapture data. And those are ongoing. Uh, those commercial fishermen efforts, there have been 17 fishing days between December of 2019 and this past week. Uh, there might even have been one yesterday. Uh, to date, uh, these are the most updated numbers we have. Commercial fishermen have removed 4,062 silver carp, 135 big head carp, 400 grass carp, and an estimated 1,788 common carp. Common carp numbers are somewhat incomplete. We had to extrapolate based on weights on a few occasions where they did not provide number of individuals removed. We're pretty confident that, you know, around 1800 common carp have been removed. Uh, again, my mind is personally blown at 4,000 silver carp being removed from Emiquan. And sadly, they're still going strong uh, pulling out silver carp. But with that data, we can get to our population estimates from the mark recapture study. Uh, for this, we pooled uh, silver and big heads, so we combined them. Uh, the main reason was we have a low number of recaps. Uh, we have six silver carp that are recapped and one big head carp uh, that are recapped. We also pooled them because they have similar uh, behaviors, and they each have kind of exhibited a tendency to avoid recapture. Bit of a long story, uh, but they, they are known to tend to avoid nets when they've already been caught once in said nets. Uh, but silver and big head, we estimate 156,060 individuals in Emiquan, plus or minus 88,000. Uh, that plus or minus is 95% confidence interval. So the confidence interval is pretty big. Uh, even on the low side, there's a substantial number of silver and big heads uh, potentially swimming around in Emiquan. Common carp, we estimate 69,985 plus or minus 44,000. Uh, grass carp, take with a bit of grain of salt, our numbers of tagged. Uh, removed and recapped grass carp is low on all counts, but for grass carp, we estimate 3,300 plus or minus 2,100 grass carp swimming around uh, in Emiquan. Again, for all four species, even if we're at the low end of our population estimates, there's a lot of carp potentially coming around the Emiquan. I'm going to switch gears one more time. It's kind of the last uh, leg of the, of the structure that we're building here. Uh, age structure. Uh, I'm going to stick with silver carp again. Uh, and you can collect certain structures, as Jim alluded to, and age the fish. Uh, so on the right, we see a pectoral fin spine that's been sectioned. Uh, the white rings indicate it overwintered, though this fish is five years old. Uh, I hope I'm not getting close to it on time, but I might move a little quickly here. Uh, we have structures from four years, 2017, 18, 19, and 20. We're going to skip 2017 and 2019 because we don't have that many structures to work with. 2018 and 2020, we have a respectable number of structures aged uh, that we can work with. So age structure in the Emiquan Preserve, uh, with age of the fish on the X, number of fish on the Y. 2018 fish that we aged, uh, we kind of have a split age structure. We have about half of them are four-year-old fish, and about half of them are five-year-old fish. Uh, in 2020, they're almost all five-year-old fish. Contrast this with Lagrange, where again, we have pretty Silver carp data. On the grain, you see a more traditional, you know, age structure graph uh, with a peak at three-year-old fish from the 2014 year class, which was exceptionally massive. So Emiquan, a limited age structure, three-year classes dominating the data we have versus the range. You know, it's a little more of an even spread of different age structures. So uh, I want to spend a little time here to talk about paths into Emiquan. I'm building to the question that I think everybody wants to know the answer to. So if you remember what Doug talked about, you remember the timeline, 2013, 
uh, the flood overtopped the levee. It was in late April and early May that that happened. 2015, it overtopped in July. 2016, it overtopped in January. Water boils in 2015 in the summertime at the construction site. Uh, Doug informed me we had gravity feeding water in 2016 and 2017 that could have let in potential species through the structure. But it kind of builds to the question of when did these carp species move uh, into Emiquan, specifically uh, big heads and silvers? I think we can get at the answer uh, with the age data. Before I cover this slide, uh, everyone remember that silver carp and big heads can't physically reproduce uh, in the Emiquan preserve, so far as we know. Uh, we think they need flowing water, lots of it, as in tens of river miles to successfully you know, spawn eggs to hatch and, and fish, to, fish to grow. They should not be able to reproduce an Emiquan that has no current. So uh, all the fish in Emiquan, we're assuming, pretty safe to say, came from the Lagrange reach of the Illinois. With that, let's back to our 2018 age data. It supports the 2013 and 2014 year class. 2014 was a massive year class. 2013s, you know, when did they get an Emiquan? There's a chance they came in on the flood of 2013. That was early. You know, we're talking about early May. Out of the realm of possibility, they could have got a spawn off very early on, uh, and those fish could have snuck in over the levee. Would have been early spawn, but it's been known to happen at that time of year. Uh, the 2014 year class, it was, again, it was massive. Those fish were everywhere as young as years. Uh, they could have easily came in a 2015 flood at, as, as year one fish. Uh, they still would have been small. They could have snuck over the levee probably without too much trouble and got in through the 2015 flood, even potentially the 2016 flood in January. Uh, the 2020 age data supports a 2015 year class on the LaGrange River. Uh, this time frame actually works out frighteningly perfectly because, you know, they spawn in the spring, early summer, maybe over tops in the midsummer of 2015. Uh, it, it matches perfectly that if they were out there, they could have got in and it seems that they did. Uh, they could have also snuck in in January of 2016 when they were a little larger. Uh, you know, fish don't tend to move as much in the winter, but, you know, they could definitely have made it in on either or both occasions. Uh, the LTM data uh, that I mentioned earlier, we have a pretty decent fisheries data set on the LaGrange Reach. Again, I won't go into details for time constraints, but our LTM data show weak year classes of silver carp in both 2013 and 2015 uh, around that massive year class in 2014. Well, that doesn't exactly paint a clear picture because it wouldn't support 2013 and 2015 year classes getting in. Having said that, you know, there's the chance that we missed it out there every day, you know, there could be a week where we're just not at the right spot at the right time and we potentially miss a year class coming through the system. Uh, could have happened. I think I trust the age data and that points to multiple entries uh, potentially over the levee as, as levees overtop. I also want to note that adults could probably come over during a levee overtopping event or in some of the other events that I mentioned. Uh, I don't think this is as likely, especially in great, great numbers. But, you know, it's, it's definitely possible, and uh, it probably did happen at least, at least a little bit. Uh, conclusions. Uh, silver, common, and grass carp are sadly doing very, very well in the Emiquan Preserve. Probably big heads as well, even though we don't present much data on those. Uh, they're much more abundant than the authors would have expected, uh, specifically this author. Uh, 4,000 silver carp removed is beyond mind-boggling for me in a sad sort of way. Uh, silvers are larger in Emiquan than in Lagrange. Uh, they likely enter on two or more you know, occasions as the levee overtops or potentially through the structure in those gravity feeding uh, ep episodes. Uh, this is the story so far. We have more plans for this project, more plans for these structures and this data. So I guess stay tuned on that front. Uh, I want to close by acknowledging again Ali and Amber. Without them, this project doesn't happen. Recall, I'm just a messenger. Uh, IRBS staff and technicians for A, working on Emiquan all through the years on the routine monitoring data, and B, going six boats deep on the massive tagging effort that we put in two full days on. Uh, Nature Conservancy for always being a good partner, and Marissa and Doug for uh, giving me some uh, data at different points of this presentation. And I'm kind of surprised I have time for questions, but I'd be happy to take any of those questions.